So yeah, hello everyone. My name is Chris Lloyd-Jones. I work for Avenard as the head of Open Innovation, and I also volunteer for Open UK as the Chief Blueprints Officer. I'm passionate about sustainability in general, so in the context of this event, particularly the Linux Foundation Energy event, I'm also part of the Green Software Foundation. You might have heard the word software there. Spoiler alert, I'm not an embedded engineer. However, I will be talking about the applicability of our blueprints to embedded development in general and the focus of this particular summit. But I'm not going to talk more about myself. Today I'll be talking about the concept of blueprints and their significance in solving thorny problems to drive creation and community collaboration around efforts which need a strong focus from groups like this. I'll start with some background on Open UK and blueprints and what they are. And then I'll talk about the two blueprints which we've already made so far at Open UK um, and their relevance in general. Open UK is a not-for-profit company which champions open technology, open source software, open hardware, and open data in the UK. But our vision extends beyond the borders of the UK, and we believe in the power of global collaboration to create a more open and sustainable digital world. We also collaborate quite closely with Open Forum Europe, the Open Invention Network, and other organizations around the world. So keep the global collaboration section in mind, as there will be some more examples as I talk through. So using an open definition, according to Wiktionary, blueprints, and I'm going to read this one off the slide, are architecture or engineering by extension, and they're a detailed technical drawing, now often in some electronically storable and transmissible form. For Open UK, blueprints are a comprehensive guide or a roadmap for creating sustainable and standardized technology infrastructure. It contains a detailed plan of the required components that an industry think they need and describes the impact that the components create. It's formulated based upon the principles of open source software, open source hardware, and open data. And each blueprint is created with a diverse group of volunteers from the private and the public sector. Um, and I'll I'll talk through who some of the members of the various blueprints were in both various different governmental organizations and private partners. I'll be talking about two blueprints today, the Patchwork Kilt Blueprint for Sustainable Data Centers, and I'll be talking about the Electric Vehicle Charging Blueprint, both available on our Open UK website and on our GitHub. But stepping back for a second about why we created these blueprints, thinking about the technology industry as a whole, or even technology practitioners. If we think about people in government, the public sector, people in the private sector, and people in the third sector, NGOs, we know, particularly the people at this conference, that technology is driving change, it's driving transformation, but there are still significant challenges. Some of those challenges involve collaboration, even in open source, a not invented syndrome, a desire to recreate the wheel, we see this when an organization spins up a new project at a particular Linux foundation and might not look either side of it to see if that project already exists. We see that in various different countries when a particular local organization might spin up a project and they're almost dividing the value of what they can do because rather than contributing to something bigger, they're creating yet another standard, kind of like the XKCD cartoon, which I missed the opportunity to get up on the screen. So we see struggles with standardization and whilst open standards are increasing in popularity, we saw IEEE sponsor some, some conferences last year. Uh, we're seeing the ISO organization and others get involved in open source. It's still very new. It's common for new projects to create competing standards. Um, we can think of the Green Software Foundation standard for software carbon intensity. We can think of some of the standards from CNCF around how they might measure carbon. And I can think of the same from various different other projects. So there are competing standards and inflexibility towards merging their differences. And finally, the technology industry historically hasn't really considered sustainability, at least until the last few years when it's become more of a pressing matter um, with projects like the Open Charge Point Protocol, um, and as I mentioned, the CNCF Sustainability Group and the Green Software Foundation. So those challenges can stop innovation and create inefficiencies. And these challenges go beyond just the innovation and the environment. They also have broader impacts on society. Inadequate collaboration and standardization can lead to a waste of resources, 
for people working on those similar projects in silos, leading to duplication, which I've already mentioned. So I've talked about the first one. Um, and the not invented here syndrome also causes companies to avoid adopting solutions that have been developed outside their own boundaries, even if they are superior. And that mentality doesn't just harm cross-pollination of ideas, but again, we have those inefficiencies and duplicated efforts. And if that continues to be the case, this will have direct and negative environmental implications. Because as we know, data centers are one of the largest consumers of electricity worldwide, and if they're left unchecked, then the energy consumption and the associated carbon emissions will contribute significantly to climate change. And as, as we roll embedded technology on the edge, from automotive-grade Linux to deployments of IoT devices in the wild, they themselves will have an impact from both carbon emissions, embodied carbon, and the energy they themselves are using. So basically, we need to tackle these issues head on. Otherwise, we're going to not only impede technological process, progress, but we can also exacerbate environmental issues and slow down the much needed transition to more sustainable energy solutions. So this is where the blueprints from Open UK come into play. So we decided to create blueprints to acknowledge and address these problems and then actively try and address them. They address these issues by looking at what's already out there, creating clear guidelines and fostering collaboration. And I'll talk about exactly how we do that in a second. And these blueprints are developed as open source, meaning that anyone can pick them up, adopt them, contribute to them, and use them for their own projects. And open source and open is more than just code. It's about the communication, the collaboration, and the transparency. It's about breaking down barriers and fostering innovation. So our role in these blueprints, going back to Open UK's aim, is to encourage global collaboration, to foster the environment where knowledge is shared, and those disparate efforts in various different countries, regions, and projects are brought together to create a unified set of solutions. So our general pro progress uh, process before I talk through some blueprint examples is, number one, we create a comprehensive guide or a roadmap. We create a detailed plan of components and subcomponents to identify the impact those components can create. Probably sounds a bit vague, a bit wishy-washy. When I get one up on screen, that'll make a little bit more sense. And each blueprint is involving all those various stakeholders that I've already mentioned. We identify the metrics they might want to measure. So, for example, what might some of the governmental organizations be trying to drive? They might be trying to improve the adoption of technology for their community. What might energy companies be trying to drive? They might be trying to drive reduced usage of fossil fuels. So we identify what each stakeholder is looking for so that we can then figure out the key metrics for me measuring progress and success. A blueprint is intended to be created globally and adopted and modified locally, so to transcend those regional barriers. And it provides a clear and concise view of the community's goals and objectives of the projects it, it represents. For example, electric vehicle charging sustainability. And a blueprint is developed through an iterative process of sense making, design thinking, drafting, critiquing. It takes a very, very long time, particularly with the members of uh, the government and others that are involved who need a lot of sign offs and review. But the blueprint work stream is not responsible for implementing the components that we identify. Its aim is to identify where there might be gaps. And those gaps can translate into potential new open source projects where there might be overlaps, projects that might want to collaborate and come together to adopt sustainable practices in the technology industry. Um, and again, I said at the start, I myself am not an um, embedded engineer. So you might be thinking, why does that actually matter here in Prague at the Embedded Open Source Summit? Well, the challenges that we're focusing on, particularly around sustainability, are often those that involve the embedded community, from energy consumption to the electrical vehicle charging network. We don't actually have a lot of the expertise that we need from people like you. So one of the reasons I'm here is to ask for your support to actually review these blueprints and identify where we might have gaps from our lack of subject matter expertise. And these blueprints are blueprints in that traditional sense of things that haven't been built yet. There's often infrastructure or components that are missing. And the focus of this standardization allows us to, again, avoid those pitfalls of duplication. The Patchwork Kilt Sustainable Data Center Blueprint, for example, outlines how to construct and operate data centers in a way that significantly reduces their environmental impact. And that may well incorporate things from the uh, Open Compute project, for example, and, and various other sustainable data center projects. So onto the blueprints. We've launched two blueprints today, the Patchwork Kilt Sustainable Data Center Blueprint and the Open Technology Electrical Vehicle Charging Blueprint. 
Both of those were selected because of the pressing issues, one around the rollout of electrical vehicle infrastructure and the various state subsidies in various different countries that may have led to distortion in the market, EV charging points that are always broken, never working, um, data centers that aren't properly recycled where energy consumption isn't measured. And the global collaboration comes into play because they weren't just created by a group of people sat in a room in the UK. They were informed by members of the Open Compute Project, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, IT Renew, Scottish 5G Center, the Octopus Energy Center for Net Zero, um, ELAD out of the Netherlands. We had members from the European Commission, from uh, various devolved governments across the UK, as well as folks out of China and the US. The idea is that each organization can bring their own unique perspectives and expertise to the table, resulting in robust, comprehensive, and innovative blueprints for technology, and a clear idea of where there are not open source projects and where we might need them. So one of the first blueprints, and it does not look very good in this blue background, but one of the first blueprints is the patchwork kilt blueprint. And that was aimed at, re at reshaping the way in which we think about design data centers for a more sustainable mo model. And the idea is that we could convert derelict retail and office spaces into 5G connected edge data centers to help the server farm industry reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by up to 80%. The idea was also to encourage hyperscale cloud giants to recycle their underutilized but quite high-end data center hardware so that we can refurbish it, extend the lifespan, recertify it, and allow other operators to make use of it. The idea is that we don't just take into account the technical requirements as well. We also look at the environmental impact. So on the left, you can see a, an overview of the life cycle of the hardware. You can see our aims. And on the right-hand side, you can see a very high-level diagram of the components that we identified, the building, energy, hardware, regulations, and then the sub-components. So for example, how we might repurpose and how people might be involved for the operations. And here it is slightly larger. And historically, data centers have been one of the largest consumers of energy. And as I mentioned, that means that if we assume that energy is a proxy for carbon, because energy has to be converted from fossil fuels in, in most of the countries in which we live, then that can generate a certain amount of CO2 emissions. So the blueprint includes everything from what are the most sustainable construction materials? What is the most energy efficient hardware to recertify? What are the most efficient cooling systems? What renewable energy sources should we be looking at? And how might we include software that optimizes energy use? And the idea, and thus the name of the blueprint, is that we create a patchwork of best practices woven together where each patch of the kilt represents a component of a data center. So we have a comprehensive holistic plan for sustainable operation. And also, once we know what components we need for a sustainable data center based upon the community involvement, we can also color code these, identify where there might be gaps. After we've identified the key components and the subcomponents, for each part of the blueprint, we identify the approach. How would we implement this in practice? If you wanted to run a data center, what might you need to do? What could the potential impact of doing this be? And again, you can see on there the embodied carbon savings of up to, 50, to 88%. You can see the resources, the various different open source groups that exist, the various different articles that exist describing how you might be able to implement a repurposed building how you might need to navigate planning permission or equivalent rules in various different countries and locations. So this first blueprint was launched at our Open Technology for Sustainability Day in Glasgow, and that was a fringe event back at COP26. The blueprint is still a living document, and we're still encouraging people to contribute, to review and collaborate, to identify new buckets or patches being added to the kilt over time. And we're also building out the approach, we're building out the resources as we, as we identify new open source communities. So think of this as almost a cross-organizational landscape, like the CNCF cloud landscape, the landscape from the to-do group, trying to identify all the relevant parties in this area. The second blueprint, which was launched mid last year, was the electrical vehicle charging blueprint which was produced to solve the challenge of sustainability in electric vehicle charging. It builds on the work of the Open Charge Alliance and the launch of the Open Charge Point Protocol beyond the initial charging infrastructure. And if you're not familiar with OCPP, if you plug an EV into basically any charge point, um, 
anywhere in the world, apart from possibly Tesla, I'm not sure about them. Nearly all the others are using this, this standard from ELART and the Open Charge Alliance. So the idea is that beyond the standards, we also need to identify the environment needed to support the uptake of electric vehicles through a joined up charging infrastructure. And that the OCPP is already looking at how might we share data between vehicles, between energy providers, to support communication between all cars, charging stations, and back office systems in the same way. Um, if you can't quite read that, because it's a very detailed diagram, it's on the Open UK site, and also these slides have been sent over to Shed for uploading as well. Creating the EV charging blueprint, as I said, took a lot of time. Uh, this crazy spider diagram, which you'll probably need to look at virtually on, on the slides, was all about engaging stakeholders to identify all the different relationships between people in the electric vehicle charging ecosystem. Because we can't develop infrastructure in isolation, we need to involve all the various different parties. So we invited stakeholders that we knew to identify further stakeholders. We had uh, local governments across Europe, various different countries. So we didn't have just those involved in EV charging, such as vehicle manufacturers. We also had charging equipment manufacturers, we had grid operators, uh, we had Intel contribute, um, we had those in adjacent areas like policymakers, regulators, consumers, sustainability experts. And after we reached out to those, we ran a series of workshops over the last couple of summers to foster a holistic view of the EV charging ecosystem. And we settled on charging point operators because those people provide the infrastructure to EVs in various locations vehicle infrastructure providers because they provide the EV charging and battery installation within a vehicle, communities, the work between organizations, companies, and communities, end user services, so those might be people that provide services alongside infrastructure, so coffee shops, um, service stations, we call them in the UK, and regulation and planning, the, the standards that we have. We identified a number of different key themes in the areas of designing for circularity and sustainability, engaging local community, and collaboration across sectors. And we identified key themes across people, process, and governance. So the idea is that we wanted to look at the key ideas we had from the stakeholders in various different ways. And we identified that any process that we implement should engage the local community effectively. So EV charging points should not only serve a practical purpose, but also provide benefits to the communities in which they live. Um, to engage and promote acceptance of EV charging points, usage of EV charging points and contribute positively to local development and environmental sustainability. And to ensure that our efforts actually bear some fruit, we also need supportive policies and regulations. So again, we looked at government incentives for installing EV points. So that might mean in some countries, uh, now mandating that you take contactless card payment when you go up to a charge point, so you don't have to just download an app. That if a charge point is already present, um, there's not some kind of land grab, so that means We've often seen that if one electric vehicle operator notices an empty site, they will install a charge point there. They might not keep the charge point working or up to date. The charge point may well not be working, but they bought that land and installed it so that their competitors cannot install a charge point. And if you had a traditional fuel burning car, such as petrol or diesel, there are regulations across the world that mean that you have a guaranteed amount of uptime. Generally, that's around 90% in most countries. That means your petrol pump, if you're advertising fuel, must actually be available to take payment during its advertised opening hours. We don't have that for EV charging. So we looked at what local regulations might we need to copy and adopt from petrol vehicle stations so that people can go to an EV charge point, know they can plug in their car, and know that they can keep driving. So it's not just about the technology, it's about the people, the process, and the governments. So in no country, like in UK, for example, is there no regulation for the uh, companies to actually do that? So they then just not turn them off and people don't have to char cannot charge their cars? So you asked if there's regulation in countries already to charge cars compared to traditional petrol cars? Yes. It varies around the world. Um, in most countries now, there is regulation about where you can site your charger because we don't want to overload the electricity substations. There's usually now regulation about whether or not you, and how you install the charger. Um, it must be done to a certain standard. But there are generally, in many countries, not regulations about uptime. So that means you can advertise an EV charging station, drive along to it, 
it won't be open. It will be, it'll be faulty. Um, there's actually a supermarket near me where for about a year now, the EV charging stations have been broken and down, and there's no regulation forcing that to, to be online. So we want these blueprints to be policy ready as well. Um, and we identified key themes as well as the key stakeholders, infrastructure, regulation and planning, vehicle infrastructure and user services, charging operators and community engagement. So those final use cases translated into the components of the blueprint and the approach ensured that the final EV charging blueprint incorporated a wide range of views and considerations. I think it's a comprehensive plan to address not only technical but also economic policy as well as environmental challenges associated with the infrastructure. The stakeholder identification process shows, I think, the blueprint's emphasis and in collaboration, inclusivity and openness. And this is why, again, I've come here to ask more people to try and become involved. So as I begin to wrap up, I'll share our next steps. So number one, our blueprints provide a solid foundation for addressing some, although not all of the issues plaguing the tech industry. They offer a model for collaboration, standardization and sustainability. As you probably saw from the pictures though, our blueprints are currently locked away in slides and PowerPoints, even though they're in a Git repository. So we're now working on making the data machine readable. So can we look at the visualizations? Can we automatically identify changes to some of the resources that we identify to improve the accessibility and utility of the information? And again, embedded software practitioners are on the cutting edge of a lot of this innovation. So you're creating the code that powers our vehicles, our devices, and our data centers. So we really do want your involvement, I cannot emphasize that enough. We're also in the process of revising our blueprints at the moment for an event later this year, our Open UK's upcoming Sustainability Technology Day. And I'd like to invite you to join the event, either in person or remotely, to learn about these updates and how they can impact your work, and also take part in sessions to help us to refine those blueprints. Um, the Open Technology for Sustainability Day takes place in Edinburgh on the 14th of September later this year. The event is sponsored by Intel on the Open Compute project. If you'd like to attend or sign up and see the schedule, then we have a QR code there, and I'll keep it up for the final slide, which you can scan. Really interested. Um, if you have a time, please go onto our website, onto our GitHub, add some issues, um, add some pull requests. If you don't have the time and you don't want to dive into anything beyond the code, feel free to turn up on the day, take part in some workshops, and give us some of your experiences. So I've had one question. With that, if I can ask if there are any other questions, um, otherwise I'll be around for the last few sessions of the LF um, Energy Summit. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers. So any question for Christopher? You can find me on Twitter, you can find me on Discord. Thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Thank you.